I'm Dr. Jane Symington. I'm pleased to present to you today some of the neurological implications of trauma, as well as the spiritual perspectives of trauma. I titled this presentation, Trauma Responses and Soulful Counseling. I'm a trauma and grief therapist and counselor. I'm an educator. I'm a researcher and much of my research focuses around using alternate and complementary methods of healing to address the emotional and spiritual concerns related to the implications of post-traumatic stress. So today I'll give you a little bit more of that information and speak to you mostly around the soulful manifestations. And the reason I want to do that is because frequently we have presentations on the physical aspects of trauma, the mental aspects of trauma, and the emotional responses to trauma. But we rarely hear of the implications of the spiritual manifestations of trauma. And for many people, their soul pain is the most significant of their trauma experiences and one that is rarely addressed and when it's rarely addressed they struggle sometimes for years with those imponderable questions about what's going on in the dark night of their soul during that time of spiritual distress and what I refer to as soul pain. Before we go deep into the content Let's make sure that we all understand that trauma is a horrific experience. It is sudden. It's horrifying, terrorizing often, and it leaves the person feeling in a state of disempowerment. And so the other thing to understand is when we have a major grief, it can feel like trauma has happened to us. But we must understand that there is a difference between grief and trauma. So a question I'd like you to ponder, can we have grief without trauma? And the answer is definitely yes. We can have grief without trauma. My mother was 90 years old when she died. She lived a long and healthy life. Still in her 90th year, was driving her own car around her own small community, visiting the sick. I had done my closure with my mother. That was not trauma. Trauma is sudden. It's unplanned. A sudden death is trauma. A child's death is trauma. A car accident is trauma. Horrific things that happen. So when my son was killed at 13, that was trauma. And left me with significant post-traumatic stress symptoms. It is different than grief, although you can have grief without trauma. You cannot have trauma without grief. Every aspect of us is broken when we experience trauma. We experience trauma in the brokenness of our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual manifestations. And it hugely affects our relationships. And we can have grief without trauma, but we cannot have trauma without grief. Another definition I'd like you to have as we begin this discussion, trauma can result from disasters and trauma can result from atrocities. Disasters are forces of nature. So trauma can happen as a result of flooding, forest fires, volcanoes, those kinds of experiences caused by nature. Trauma can also be inflicted by other human beings, and then they are referred to as atrocities. 
So clear examples are child abuse and domestic violence. Much was experienced during residential school experiences. Those are atrocities and they can cause significant trauma. It's important to also know that trauma can be referred to as primary trauma, meaning it happens to us directly. We can also have trauma that is secondary. We can pick up trauma vicariously. And as counselors, it's important that we understand vicarious trauma. Hearing about trauma, witnessing trauma can be very traumatic to the person. And as we hear those stories over and over and over, they become sometimes part of our own memory system. And often it's said that healing from vicarious trauma may be more difficult than healing from primary trauma. The last definitions I'd like you to have in mind are what we call single blow trauma, which happens once. And while that can take many, many years without the right therapists, without the right help, without the right supports, when there is multiple trauma, meaning over and over and over, it results in many more significant psychological and psychiatric symptoms. So single blow and multiple blow trauma are many of the issues that I work with continually. And in the training that I do and in the workshops that I provide, we often are dealing with multiple blow traumas and good examples of multiple blow traumas, child abuse, domestic violence. They're happening over and over and over. And the person hardly gets to even get their feet back on the ground before the next trauma happens. I'd like to Make sure that those of us who are listening to this presentation and maybe using my words are aware that we never know who's in the audience. And so I'd like to begin by stating that even information can cause triggers. And if that should be happening to you as you view this presentation and listen to this presentation, if you're feeling triggered, an ache in your body, a flashback, I'd like you to breathe through the experience. So to start, I'm going to teach you two, what we call emotional first aid breathing techniques. So in the first, as soon as you feel any, even the slightest trigger, I'd like you to just remind yourself, breathe. Just breathe, push it out. That's what we call level one, 
first aid, emotional first aid breathing. So please try it. Breathing in, and what we call the long exhale, push it out. And why do we want to do that? As soon as we're triggered, we often hold our breath. And when we hold our breath, we are building up too much CO2 in our brain. And we need to get rid of that. Because as a trauma therapist, I know that people can actually collapse because they have done way too much panic breathing and have built up too much CO2. So big breath in, push it out. And level two of emotional first aid breathing. Big breath in. And just push it as if you could push it right down through the soles of your feet. So let's practice that together. Feel it coming right down out the soles of your feet. And so to comprehend soulful counseling, we have to understand a little bit about what is spiritual distress and how does trauma push us in to a dark night of the soul experience, push us into those moments of feeling lost in our own soul, in our own spirit. I want to spend time discussing that. It's also necessary that we understand the relationship between our spirit and the nervous system responses. So we will look a little bit at the neurology. Just a small bit and very easy to understand discussion. As we said earlier, trauma can leave us feeling powerless. And I wanna reemphasize those powerlessness feelings are felt and experienced physically, mentally, socially, emotionally, and spiritually. And to heal from trauma, we must be examining each of these aspects. Like I said, I will look at some of that, but our major presentation is going to be on the soulful aspects. And how do we work with that in ourselves, and if you're a counselor, how do we help another in that regard? Looking first at the neurological perspective. So neurology, of course, meaning the brain and the nervous system. And how does that impact us? The initial trauma response is one of a surge of adrenaline. The autonomic nervous system has two branches. The sympathetic is responsible for putting you into the fight and flee response through the surge of adrenaline. But there's also a second branch, the parasympathetic, which puts on the brakes, which is cortisol. And so normally these two systems, branches, work in tandem. However, in trauma, it's like we are tramping on the gas and then tramping on the brakes and the system literally wears out and so leaves this person often feeling the major symptom of hypervigilance. We're always waiting for the next attack. We're always hyper aroused in the nervous system looking for what else is going to happen to me. So in the fight and flee response, generally speaking, if we feel we are strong enough, we will try to fight to get away from the assailant, for example. If we feel we can, we might run. If we can't, and if the system becomes overwhelmed, we go into what's known as freeze. And when we freeze, we are 
neurologically paralyzed. And so in the freeze response, initially, and every time we go back there, triggered back, we stand the chance of going into that freeze response again. So in the freeze response, the sense is dull. We don't see clearly. We can't hear clearly. It seems like our body won't work and we cannot speak even clearly. It seems like we are frozen in this state and literally we are because the nervous system is feeling the effects of being overwhelmed. And the second thing that can happen in the freeze response is we dissociate. And what dissociation means is that we actually escape from our body. So it's a split with reality. And we'll say more about dissociation in a few moments because it is a big thing to understand when we're talking about the spiritual manifestations of trauma. To go further, let's look at the process to dissociation. I ask you in the beginning to be mindful of your triggers. And if you're being triggered to actually breathe yourself back. So be mindful. So a trigger is a reminder. It's a reminder of a past trauma or a past difficult life experience. We can have positive triggers as well. However, in this presentation, we're using the word trigger as a reminder of a very past difficult life experience. And so the triggers can come from all of our senses, a sight, a sound, a smell, a taste, a touch. When I worked at the federal prison for women, I learned that even the word trigger can be a trigger because some of them had been shot at. And so we can also have triggers from our soma, the body's own responses. So those aches that we feel, like for instance, if we've been starved, any time that we have hunger pains, that can be a deep trigger for us. Triggers are reminders. If they're not managed, they can lead to flashbacks. Now, while a trigger is a reminder, a flashback is actually a re-experiencing of the trauma. So we hear the same sounds, see the same sights, feel the same sensations, and the same amount of adrenaline starts surging through our body. And if that's severe enough, we can dissociate. And dissociation, as I said earlier, is a split with reality. Dissociation is actually a split between body and mind and between body and mind and spirit. So we literally escape. So people will say, I'm beside myself. My response as a therapist, let's just breathe your spirit right back here. So we use symbolic language. It's soulful language. Yes, you are beside yourself. Stay with me. Breathe yourself fully back. Fully back so that mind and body and spirit are again grounded, centered within. And so this separation can become a coping strategy. Well, initially it's a neurological response, but when we are separated, we do not feel. And it reduces the physical and the emotional distress. So some have told me I would watch the abuse, but my, I was always above it. I would rise out of my body immediately sometimes, even when he came home. My body would be there, but I was not there. And so a sense that we have actually left the physical body. So that is a sense of knowing at some level that our spirit, the real us, has escaped. 
the traumatic scenario that's going on for us in our life right now. So from a neurological perspective, we will examine two very important aspects of the midbrain, the amygdala and the hippocampus. Both of these are parts of the limbic system. And the limbic system in the midbrain is responsible for emotion. So keeping that in mind is important. During the normal course of our lives, they work together. So they work very well together. We have the emotion and we have a sense of what that emotion is attached to. Let's examine these a little more carefully. So the amygdala receives from the brainstem what's going on. The message comes immediately into the brainstem, moves right up to the midbrain, and the amygdala captures the emotion and the body sensations related to that. Then it's moved up to the hippocampus and the hippocampus gives meaning to the event. So we talk about that as context. So it places the emotion and the information together. That's the job of the hippocampus giving context to the feeling, the emotion we're having. The who, the what, the where, the when, the how. That's contextual information related to the emotion. However, during trauma, that process is interfered with. The amygdala continues to capture the emotion and often in very highly charged picture form. But the hippocampus can become overcharged and overcharged by the cortisol, the braking system from the fight and flee response. And if there's enough of that, it can shut down. So what happens then in trauma is the amygdala stores the emotion and it's like they become frozen there, frozen in time and frozen at that scene of the trauma. And they're often very highly charged and the pictures that are stored there, the emotion is often stored in highly charged picture form. So when you're flashing back or your client is flashing back, it's believed that they're actually flashing back to that intrinsic memory, to that memory that's trapped there in the amygdala but without the information. And if it can't get through the hippocampus on its way to the cortex, it cannot be stored fully as extrinsic memory that is happening in the past. So for a person who's been traumatized and their hippocampus has shut down a lot during the time of the trauma, that person is continually living that trauma in the present. And so it's what we call intrinsic memory. It's like it's happening now. We can't relegate it to the past. So the second major symptom of post-traumatic stress is what we call intrusions. So we've just talked about the intrusions. The intrusions are the triggers, the flashbacks, the going back, and not really going back, but we are going back, but it's like we are in the present and we don't understand that it happened in the past. It is as if it's happening over and over and over in the relative now. So let's move to look more deeply at the spiritual worldview on trauma. It's believed in many cultures, past and present, that when trauma happens, 
parts of our spirit can flee. And the fleeing is the teaching. What really happens is that part remains frozen in time. And when it's frozen in time, also are the characteristics, the soul gifts that are trapped with that particular part of the soul that got trapped when that person dissociated, when they lost parts of themselves deeply at a deep unconscious level at that time of the trauma. So that part remains, just to re-emphasize, as if frozen in time. Let's look at that in a little more detail from a spiritual perspective. I can't draw your soul. It's infinite. Maybe even many lifetimes. However, most spiritual teachings from around the world and from cultures around the world talk about soul gifts. Some people refer to them as virtues. Matters not the language. We know some soul gifts. Love. Hope, trust, trust in the universal order. Trust that if we're good people, good things will happen. And that can be significant then for us, devastating for us, when our trust in the universal order is broken. Because bad things shouldn't happen to good people. And when we know we're good people and bad things happen, that's devastating. And it can take years to get that trust back in God, self, others. So we have love, hope, trust, the ability to be creative. Those are all soul gifts. The ability to feel joy, to feel happiness, to feel success. Those are soul gifts. And we feel full and whole when we have all of our aspects together. However, when trauma happens and parts of us get trapped, parts can leave. And when they leave, along with that goes a soul gift, a soul characteristic. And so when people have trauma, they will sometimes say, I used to be so creative. And I don't know where my creativity went. I used to be able to love. And I can't love anymore. I can't trust anymore. I'm hopeless. And so you can see that these empty spaces. Or you can sense that these empty spaces. What do we try to fill them up with? All kinds of addictions. And this is why most trauma therapists also study addiction therapy because we self-medicate we try to fill them up but they can't be filled but we know that something is missing and we just don't know how to get it back and so we use symbolic language the soul language you dream in symbol when we do therape therapeutic art it's symbolic representation so I often listen and I teach my counselors, listen for the symbolic language, the soulful language. So people will say, I feel so empty. I feel incomplete. Something is always missing. I no longer feel whole. Now, if you think of these empty spaces, it's not hard to understand the symbolic language. The person doesn't know how to get the part back, but they are aware that something is definitely missing. We can have dreams. I'm Jungian, dream therapist. Jung believed very much that dreams are soul messages. His language is, it's a message from the gods. And if we haven't bothered to interpret it, it's a letter 
that we haven't bothered to read. When we understand that kind of thinking, we become more attuned to listening for symbolic language. One dream that many people have when they have had soul parts fracture off is what we refer to as the house dream. So in this dream, the person finds themselves going into a house and now the house is symbolic of soul coming into this lifetime knowing it needs a place to live in physical reality. So the house is very symbolic of your consciousness. You in consciousness. You in physical reality, really. So in the dream, the person comes into the house and they search from room to room to room to room to empty room. Am I here? Did I leave me here? Where did I leave me? Where am I? So it's a searching dream. It's often very gratifying for me as a counselor because I ask, what is your dream life like? I want to know if this person is having dreams of searching and especially if they're having the house dream. And so if they're having the house dream, I know that it's really important that we do soul retrieval. There can also be dreams of searching in other forms. So searching dreams are often symbolic. Triggers and healing. From a spiritual perspective, a trigger is often viewed as a signal. It's a soulful reminder to the person. You have an unhealed soul wound. Pay attention to what is triggering you. Because if you can get under that trigger, that's where the healing needs to take place. Flashbacks are even a deeper soulful reminder because in the flashback, we go right back to the scene. And we are then told, this is where your parts have fractured off. This is the scene. You need to heal this and bring that part back. Dissociation is clearly an opportunity. And because I know how to work with dissociation, I call it a spontaneous healing. So if the person has dissociated and is right back there, I ask them, to do the healing work. So with the help of their spirit guides or whoever it is they work with, I have them go up to that soul part, do a healing for that soul part, update that soul part, because if that part went away long ago, it has no clue. It's lost in consciousness. It has no clue what you are doing with your life. Update it bring it back, and then there's a process of reintegrating it into body, mind, and spirit. So during dissociation, the person views that part. During soul retrieval, I will initiate that therapy. And most of my counselors who take the trauma recovery certification course know how to do soul retrieval work. It is a significant and for me, a primary part of doing trauma healing. And so we do then what was called the initiated retrieval. So in a process of regression, taking the person gently back, we do exactly that. Have them see that part of themselves, heal that part of themselves, update that part of themselves, and then integrate that part of themselves back into the reality of their physical body, their mind, and their emotion, where they now are in this time and place. When parts return, 
there is this incredible joy that is experienced. People look different. And in the course, in the trauma recovery certification course, people, participants look at each other in the morning after a soul retrieval and they know that this person has changed. They look different. Their eyes are different. The eyes are always the tellers. They are the windows of the soul. So these therapists need to know how to do that. So a soulful therapist, someone who is holistic in their practice, understands that they need to help healing the body, the mind, the emotion, and the spirit. It's all part of who we are as holistic human beings. So our therapists know how to use right brain strategies. Why is that important? Right brain strategies are guided visualization, therapeutic art, meditation, dream work. They are soulful strategies. Why is that important that we work with strategies that address the right hemisphere? The most significant reason beyond spiritual is since 2004, MRI studies done by Ruth Lanius has shown that we process our trauma memories through the sensory and imaging functions of the brain's right hemisphere, not the left. So if you want to address healing, you have to address the place in the brain where the trauma memories are processed. Yet many counselors use only left hemisphere strategies, language. We'll say more about that in a minute. But many of the functions of the left hemisphere are not functioning during trauma. You can help that person, but as we'll say later, you will not heal them by only using language strategies, which many of us have been taught to use extensively. To help us understand a little bit more deeply, the brain is divided right down the middle, large bundle of nerves, the corpus callosum, and its job is to move information back and forth across the hemispheres. The hemispheres actually have two different modes of being and communicating. So the left hemisphere, the more dominant hemisphere in our cultures, is the hemisphere that you're probably using right now. You're trying to pay attention. So attention and retention, learning, all our cognitive abilities, our mental functioning abilities, are functions that are directed by the left hemisphere. The language center sits, for most people, Broca center, in the left hemisphere. When trauma happens, we often have what's called speechless terror. The effects of the braking system often close down the language center. So the person has a difficult time articulating, speaking, telling their story. And as a counselor, if we only use language and these functions aren't working that well, and think of a child in school, reading, writing, and arithmetic are left hemisphere functions. When we're triggered, when we flash back, these functions are not working well. And so a child in school who is struggling and they come from a home where there's childhood abuse, domestic violence, if they've experienced their own trauma, they struggle with left hemisphere functions. It has nothing to do with intelligence. Right hemisphere functions are soulful functions, emotional soulful functions. Those functions include creativity, 
Therapeutic art. Meditation. That's where we dream from. The language of the right hemisphere is symbol. It's symbolic language. So because I'm also a grief therapist and I've worked for many years, my background is both nursing and psychology. For a lot of years, I worked in palliative care, care for the dying. As a person is dying and their left hemisphere starts closing down because of the lack of oxygen and other reasons, they become much more soulful, right hemisphere functioning. And the language becomes much more symbolic. So they will say, I'm ready to go home. That home isn't the home down the street. It is the soulful home. And so understanding a little bit about symbolic language is essential for my therapists when they go out to practice in a soulful counseling modality. To do soul work on ourselves or with others, we have to listen to and be able to respond to soul pain. Those nagging questions, the why, 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 now what? Those are questions of meaning and purpose. Why is always a question. Why are the gods so angry at me? Why am I being punished like this? And the now what question actually comes after we've done a lot of healing and the person is saying, I've changed. Trauma is often referred to as spiritual disconnection, but it's also often referred to as spiritual transformation because after the person has done a tremendous amount of healing, their spiritual energies have increased. They know they're a different person. And sometimes the old ways of doing things just don't resonate anymore. And they start asking, now what? That's a question of soulful purpose. Now what am I to do with the rest of my life? But there are many soul nagging questions in the middle. Many of the old beliefs that we've held that have been given to us by other people no longer hold up under the fires of our own soulful experience, of our own trauma, of our own pain. We've been taken apart and we look carefully as we put ourselves back together. But we're never put together the same. And if we've done our healing work, we have changed and we're a different person in the spiritual transformation. As a soulful counselor, working on ourselves, working with another, we have to be able to apply both helping and healing strategies. So helping strategies are the strategies that address the needs of the brain's left hemisphere, the cognitive hemisphere, the mental hemisphere. Since much of that has shut down as a result of trauma, attention and retention are very altered. But that person needs your help. They need counseling strategies. They need new coping strategies. They need ways to change behavior. Those are all information. They need to be able to speak little bit by little bit and share the deep stories, the remember and the mourning of their trauma. But you also need for yourself and for those you're working with, helping and healing strategies. So the healing strategies are those interventions that gain the attention of the brain's right hemisphere. That's why I took therapeutic art and in all my work, in all my courses, my counselors learn to use therapeutic art. They learn to use visualization, imagery, meditation strategies. Those are all strategies that gain the attention of the brain's right hemisphere. 
We're meant to be whole people. The brain has been interfered with. During trauma, it does not function as a whole unit. We need to work with our left hemisphere and our right. We need to reintegrate again both those functions so that we're working from both hemispheres as a whole person. Our, our life cannot work well and will stay in brokenness as long as those hemispheres are not working together. We need balance. We need grounding. We need to work on ourselves using both our right and our left hemispheres. And if you're a counselor, it's essential to work in both hemispheres using those strategies that we know are effective. We need to be a good helper, but we need to be an excellent healer. And so to do so, we need to understand what are the physical, mental, emotional, and soulful manifestations of trauma. I hope that this presentation has increased your understanding of the soulful responses and some ideas for how you might move yourself forward through your own soulful experience, grow soulfully, and if you're a counselor, how you might help others. And if you're on the road to becoming a counselor, it would be my great wish that together we can work at advancing your soulful abilities. And so as we come to the close of this, take the time, if you choose, to learn more about this. My, web's, my website is full of much good information, written information on the trauma course. All of my courses are accredited by the Canadian Council of Professional Counselors. They carry with them, a number of them carry with them, masters, degree courses. A number of them also carry with them uh, units, educational units, toward becoming an addiction counselor. And those are all benefits of taking the courses. www.takingflightinternational.com is my website. On that website, you will find information about each of the accredited courses. It will also lead you to the Dr. Jane Symington website, which tells a little more about me. It tells about the workshops that I offer and provide. And it will also lead you to the Taking Flight books website, which provides you the information on the books I have written. My first book, Journey to the Sacred, Mending a Fractured Soul, is my story about how I survived the death, the tragic death of my 13-year-old son. That story took me from beliefs to knowing it's a story of spiritual transformation and how I now work with others to guide that process. That book won me, or won for me, I should say, the Woman of Vision Award. The next book that you will find on the website, Through Soul's Eyes. After I published Journey to the Sacred, I was asked, give us more skills. So that book has a lot of art activities, a lot of guided visualization and imagery activities for you to use to help yourself and to help another person. That book won me the award Woman of Distinction. Both those books are published in Spanish and in German. 
You will also find on my bookstore two videos. They have both won awards, Listening to Soul Pain and Healing Soul Pain. On the bookstore, you will also find many audio recordings. All of them are geared from moving you to a simple process of grounding to doing incredible soul healing work. They are part of the courses that I teach, but they are also available for sale. I look forward to working with you and to being with you at another opportunity. If you have any questions you would like to pose to me, you can send them to Jane at takingflightinternational.com. Thank you for your time and your great interest.